The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Why did he use that word? God goes to extreme measures to bring the loss to himself. The greatest gift you will ever give this world is your intimacy with God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three inside of me. I've got the power right now. I think what Jesus really wants is people to go. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Welcome to the Fuel for the Harvest podcast. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Hey everyone, and welcome to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. I'm Nathan. And I'm Charlie. We're your hosts for today. And we're really excited to welcome to the podcast today, Jason Holland. Uh, He is the president of Joshua Nations, and they do phenomenal work all around the world. So yeah, thanks for joining us, Jason. It's an honor to be here with you today. Excited to continue all around the world and uh, taking his gospel and reaching the unreached. Yeah, awesome. I don't know if it's fuzzy there on the the recording, but the internet's a little crazy these days, so (laughs) uh, cut out there for a second. But yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and a little bit about the Joshua Nation's vision. Yeah, so I am a a third-generation minister and grateful for a Christian heritage. And actually, I grew up on the campus of a Bible school. My dad was a Bible school professor a pastor and still continues to pastor. Um, And the Lord called me to missions uh, uh, right after high school. That was not my plan, but he, uh, he called me and a little bit reluctantly, I surrendered, not (laughs) knowing what I was getting into, but uh, looking back now, I'm very grateful for that. But over the last uh, 22 years, been involved in missions in some capacity. And most of that time has been full time. And I have the wonderful privilege of leading a ministry called Joshua Nations. And uh, our focus really is to disciple and train up a new generation of church leaders around the world. And uh, we do that through a variety of ways. But our primary way is to establish a church-based Bible school using a curriculum that we've developed uh, in partnership with uh, reputable uh, ministers from all around the world and provide a two-year Bible school program that is in the local language. We translate it for them, or they actually do the translation, but we fund the translation. Then it's printed into a book, and we teach them how to build a self-sustainable Bible training center or Bible school. Wow, that's phenomenal. It's really phenomenal. And you know what's more phenomenal is what the Holy Spirit has done with it, because it's definitely nothing that we have done. But there's over 7,000 of them now all around the world. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. 7,000 Bible schools, right? Over 7,000 Bible schools. Most of them are uh, put or placed within local churches, but we have some that are actually uh, within businesses, Christian owned businesses Hmm. in closed or restricted nations. And so I was given the privilege and I can't name the nation, but uh, I was given the privilege in Asia to launch a Bible training center in a restricted nation around a conference table with the CEO of a pharmaceutical company and uh, Christian believers that worked for him. Wow, that was really one of the highlights of uh, what we do. Yeah. So that's our primary thing is, uh, is training leaders that way. But we also do training for church planters, and we have specific and focused initiatives for reaching unreached and unengaged people groups as well. And all those look a little bit different too. So yeah. how, how did you initially get that kind of like vision for raising up national leaders? So obviously there's a lot of different ways to do missions. Like what, what was it that led you to that specific method? I began doing missions work while I was in Bible school in the late 90s. And I actually did mission stuff with my family growing up. Uh, And so I just remember the Lord really speaking to my heart about the importance of missions and empowering local leaders. So a few years go by after Bible school, I was continuing my education uh, with uh, pursuing some other degrees. And I got connected with a wonderful ministry and began doing missions work with them. And our focus was training 
pastors and church leaders, very similar to what I do now. But we did a lot of conferences. And so we would gather anywhere from a dozen to several hundred pastors and church leaders and then spend about three days doing a conference style uh, training. It was very powerful, very impacting. Um, the men and women would come uh, very tired and even beat down. I did a survey one time, about 40% of them were ready to throw in the towel if God didn't do something at that particular wow. event. Hmm. And while I was doing those events, I saw that their spirits were lifted, they were excited. And at the end of the event, they were ready to continue on. Many of them committed to even plant churches and start new ministry initiatives. But what started happening uh, was I received the request. At the end of the events, I would have numerous men and women come to me. And because of what I taught at the event, which was always about multiplication discipleship and raising up new leaders, they would say, we want you to come back and spend a week with us or more teaching us how to raise up a new group of leaders. And they said, we need more time specifically focused on that subject. And then the same thing began to happen with church planting as well. And so uh, my heart was just burdened with that. And that continued to happen over and over for a couple of years. And it really became somewhat overwhelming. And I felt that need. I began to pray into that specific need that was being given to me. And I remember I was out on a, a run in the Texas heat. Hmm. Uh, I'm originally from Texas. I don't live there anymore, but I was out on a run in the Texas heat. And I know I was not delusional or delirious, <laughs> probably on the verge of heat exhaustion. But I remember the Lord speaking to me and uh, shifting my vision and my focus to helping establish long-term transformational processes that would raise up new leaders. Mm. And um, as he began to turn my heart, I would pray about that over and over each day as I was out exercising and running. And then he spoke real clear to me one day. He said, whatever you do, don't multiply dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was already seeking um, and looking for ways that whatever process, whatever uh, curriculum or program that I would teach or even potentially create would be focused so that the dysfunctional things we see in church leadership that probably every Christian has seen at some point in some form that those things would be addressed uh, in, in a proper way, but, but leaders would then grow into a place where they're not hurting the flock. They're not replicating uh, problems, you know, whether that was uh, systemic issues rooted in pride or greed, um, authoritarianism or, or whatever that may be but really just to teach scripture and put in the process of that program, that transformational things that would make a healthy church, mm. healthy pastors, healthy church planters, healthy indigenous missionaries. And so that, that kind of got me on the path of wanting to do what I do now. Awesome. And that's really cool. How did, I'm, I'm curious too about the beginning of your story um, you had mentioned that the Lord was really calling you. How did that look for you? I mean, there could be people who are listening right now who are saying, how does calling look in my life and are exploring that? How did, how did that look for you, Jason? Okay. Well, um, my, my entire, uh, I guess, childhood and, and high school years and academic pursuits were for the sole purpose of excelling and doing great. My original plan and goal was to become a clinical psychologist or even a psychiatrist, to make a lot of money, have a mini mansion, have a uh, German-made sports car or luxury car, whether or not I was married or maybe have multiple cars, and to help people. Uh, and uh, so my, my goal was to help people. And then with my free time and money is do missions work. 
But growing up in the ministry, I'd seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I thought, I don't know that I want to be part of that. Yeah. So I enrolled at some, uh, a couple different universities. I was given scholarships based on academic merit. And after enrolling at one particular university, I was walking out and I had this overwhelming, almost sense of dread. And I looked over to my mother who was with me. I said, I'm not supposed to be here. And we both kind of teared up and it was, it was kind of a weird moment. And so we stopped the process. Well, a week later, I enrolled at another university, one that was a little more Christian. Um, I did not have scholarships at this one. I didn't have grants and, and all the great stuff you get from having uh, an academic achievement. And uh, I enrolled at this university and I, I go for actually like three or four days, go to class. It's absolutely miserable. And I was driving back home uh, to where we lived at the Bible school where my dad was a professor. And I finally prayed, I said, God, what is going on? Um, I don't know if those were the exact words, but that was definitely the heart. <laughs> it wasn't a long drawn out prayer. My drive home was about 15 minutes. And I remember about the specific location on that drive home, God said, uh, you know where I want you. And I said, oh no, God. Uh, he said, yeah, I want you there. And he wanted me to go to that Bible school that I grew up at <laughs> and said, Lord, I don't want to go there. I didn't, didn't have any desire to go there. Uh, I really felt like that was, you know, I was very arrogant. I really felt like that was beneath me and uh, God and I wrestled in this 15 minute drive home. And I said, Lord, if, if I do this, you know that I'm giving up everything. He said, exactly. Mm. But okay. So I, I actually had enough time to call my father on the way home. Their semester had been going for several weeks. I said, can you help? Can you help me get in? He said, well, of course. And I said, he said, uh, you know, what's going on? I said, well, I feel like God called me to go to school, go to Bible school. He said, oh, it's about time. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean it's about time? And he said, well, I was just waiting for you and God to work it out. But I've known all along. I said, okay. So um, it was really a uh, process of surrender. And uh, if I could say one thing about that, a lot of times we think we know what we want with our lives and our futures. Um, but if we will surrender those things to God completely, give them over to him, he will, he will replace them with dreams, visions, um, ideas, and, and even the activities with things that really bring true fulfillment. And as I look back now, I am not only beyond grateful, um, I can't imagine sitting in an office listening to people's problems all day long mm. and then trying to help them through that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, and that, that's a wonderful ministry and a career. But for me, the most exciting things in my life are the visions and the activity, yeah. the opportunities that God's put in front of me. And, and I am absolutely elated. To do <laughs> Amen. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like uh, makes me think of Paul when he says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel for I'm compelled to preach. I he, like or like Jeremiah, this word of God is in my, my bones like a fire. I'm weary of holding it in. I cannot possibly hold it in. And just that sense of calling that it seems like God will put on people's lives when they have that. It's like they could do anything else and they will be miserable unless they finally say, okay, Lord, I'm just going to do what you want. And it's worth literally laying down everything for the sake of it. Mm. So obviously God's been doing some awesome things. Um, is there any kind of testimony that you could share with us? Uh, I know you probably can't get too specific or anything, but is there any, um, anything that you can testify that the Lord is up to um, recently through Joshua Nations? Yeah, something from the field would be awesome. We know you probably had a lot of wild stories around the world. And so what, whatever you want to throw at us. Wow, there's so many incredible testimonies of what God has done. 
uh, through Joshua Nations. I think, you know, the, the biggest one is really the impact. You know, the ministry was started by another gentleman, Dr. Russ Fraze, and he continues to serve with the ministry as founder, and I'm grateful for his uh, mentorship and his love and his partnership in ministry. Uh, but it's by the Holy Spirit that we've been able to uh, see over 7,000 of these Bible training centers launched. Uh, we've seen true transformation, which is a, a huge miracle as well, where entire villages have come to a saving knowledge because of the impact of a Bible training center. Mm. Uh, we've seen holistic transformation where they start implementing biblical principles that they have learned. Um, not only do people begin to get saved and, and the village turn to Jesus, but they start practicing business principles. They practice uh, sowing, tithing, and getting and generosity to the place where that village becomes prosperous. And they're now lending to wow. other villages. Uh, they begin farming and selling and making very serious profit for, for their part of the world. So those kinds of things continue to astound me just because of the scale of uh, what happens because of an impact of uh, what Joshua nations just seeded into their village, into their people. Um, we've also seen some incredible things happen in West Africa. And uh, one of our uh, projects is focused on reaching the seven unengaged, unreached people groups that are in the nation of Niger. Mm. We don't do this alone. We have a, a strong partner who actually leads most of the uh, direction for it, and that is a ministry called City for the Nations, which is based in Lexington, Kentucky. And a, a dear friend of mine who runs that ministry, we went to Bible school together many years ago, but uh, we have gone uh, to Niger numerous times over the last 10 years. And then uh, we're sending teams about every three months and have been for the last year and a half. We've taken on this project to, to reach those seven unengaged people groups. Many of them are radical and have been absolutely untouched because of uh, radical Islam or tribal animism. Um, they are kind of the prime recruiting ground for groups like Boko Haram. Mm. And so they, they are very, very difficult. But a couple of years ago, we got a vision for reaching these seven unengaged groups. And we believe that every, uh, un every people group in Niger will be reached. And uh, by God's grace, we've seen tremendous breakthrough. So we began this project uh, a little over a year ago uh, through the training process. And we developed a very, uh, I guess, customized training between uh, uh, their ministry and ours. I, I put together that our role is the lead uh, training and curriculum, uh, I guess, designer and developer in that, uh, since that's kind of what we do. We put together processes. So I had the privilege of building a week long training program. So we recruited national missionaries. Um, that was quite a process, but we gathered them together. We had seven teams, and each team is uh, at least uh, two or more people. And two, like if you're husband and wife, that counts as one. That's one unit. And so then we had these seven teams, and we spent a whole week with them, training them. And then we sent them out on scouting trips. And then they came back, and then we did a reporting assessment. And then we designed a strategic plan. And then we launched them. And they went and they began ministering and living in those areas or living in very close proximity if they're not able to take up a residence amongst these people groups. And uh, wow, it is astounding what God is doing there now. Uh, we've seen uh, multiple churches planted amongst several of the unengaged or previously unengaged groups. We've seen people get healed, people get delivered, God move in powerful ways. Uh, there is an imam amongst the Moor people. Uh, he Well, he's no longer an imam. He got saved and baptized uh, just about a month ago. Praise God. Uh, we were getting testimonies, and I was able to uh, uh, meet some of these people groups. They 
some of the Tomasek people uh, were having dreams and visions of a man in white. Mm. And uh, when our team member uh, was sent out there and began to share with them the gospel, they said, you are talking about the man that we've been seeing in our dreams and visions, the man in white. And he's been telling us that there is a better way. And those are their words. He's been telling us there is a better way. And so he was able to fill in the detail. And uh, they, they got saved. The village chief, uh, the elder, I'm not sure exactly what they call him, but he got saved. And then his son, who was radicalized, he was having dreams and visions. He got saved. And because of the two of them turning, there was like 260 something people that immediately received Jesus within a couple of days because they said, we've been having this uh, happen to us as well. But uh, it came to that uh, conclusion or that decision, but they've made that decision and we say yes also. And so we're seeing things like that happen over and over. And uh, what, it's just, you can <laughs> kind of brings me to, uh, to tears to think about uh, God moving in power because he's so jealous in a good way and wanting to reach those who are lost. And I'm grateful that we have the privilege to just do a small part and help get the gospel to them. Yeah. Wow. Amen. That is wow. Praise the Lord. It, uh, it reminds me of, um, all of the, the people in scripture who, who just bring their little bit to God and God like just blows it up into something massive. Just like Paul going from just, he's just one guy, but he's like, <laughs> he starts a, a movement through the Gentiles that just changes everything. And it's just like, man, it, listening to you is like listening to the book of Acts. Like God is still alive. He's still moving. Um, he, he hasn't just stopped. Like <laughs> he's still, just like to use your own words, he's still jealous for all of these unreached peoples. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's, uh, I, I get excited hearing about what you guys are up to with Joshua Nations and letting other people hear about it because uh, we believe at Forge and at Fuel for the Harvest about more kingdom laborers out in the harvest field, those who are going to do the work for the kingdom of God. And of course, that's in everyday places, which I love that you guys partnered with a pharmaceutical business owner because he's going to labor for God's kingdom in those places where nobody else could inside the four walls of a church. Yet there's still these people groups waiting who don't have any laborers, not a single one, these unengaged groups, nobody's going, nobody's proclaiming. And here we're hearing one after the other, unengaged, unreached people groups starting to come to know who Jesus is and not only hear, but follow and obey. And uh, so that's pretty exciting to hear about. Um, yeah, what uh, I, I find it fascinating as you're sharing, um, if you were to talk uh, missions strategy, uh, you guys are not there full time. And there's been kind of this, I, I would say in the last maybe five to 10 years, kind of debate in the missions world of, well, if you really want to have an impact, you have to move somewhere full time. And if you don't, you'll never have an impact. Your life is showing us that that's not true. Um, but there are strategic ways of going about it. Um, is that, yeah, what do you have to say about that? Just kind of the move there full time or you, you can kind of come back and forth. There's this partnership with nationals. I mean, there's this kind of spectrum going on. And what, what's your thoughts on that spectrum? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I've had uh, lots of dialogue with numerous people and in every level regarding that particular uh, idea. So when we think about missions, um, a lot of times our historical view has been uh, we got to send someone, they got to live there, they got to look like the people, dress like the people, eat like the people, speak like the people. And when that happens, they have built a bridge to have an impact. And uh, that that is fantastic. And that's been happening uh, for 2000 years. And it continues to happen. And if God has called you to move to another uh, place, another country amongst people, that are not your own culture, if that's what he's called you to do, then do it. Be obedient. Uh, there's been four times in my adult life and marriage where my wife and I seriously prayed 
because we thought and we had a heart to move to a particular location, different locations, and we thought God might be sending us to be missionaries in that location, to live there permanently, learn the language, mm. learn the culture, and be amongst those people. And as we prayed, God said no. And each time he said, I've called you to the nations. And uh, this happened about four times. We've been married about 20 years. And uh, finally, a few years ago, we said, okay, God, we get it. <laughs> And so some people, God is called to impact nations in a different way. Now, for my personal philosophy, when it comes to mission strategy, the reason we do things the way that we do is because uh, we believe in the nationals. We believe in the indigenous people of the nations, that it is their job to inherit the nations for the kingdom of God. Uh, my kind of lodestar verse for my life and when God called me to ministry and called me out of the place of uh, things of, of uh, my own career uh, was Psalm 2.8. And so I began to ask for nations and it's for the inheritance of Jesus for God's purpose. And, and I'm grateful to be part of that. I believe that the national leaders, the national Christians of each nation are the ones to take the inheritance, that kingdom prerogative, and to take the kingdom into the places within their nations uh, where the gospel's never been heard. Um, and I believe that so strongly that, that we operate by coming in and lifting up the arms of the national Christian leaders, empowering them, equipping them, and helping them find the way to make that happen. Uh, we don't... Uh, we don't do ongoing funding, so we're not just throwing money at them to create a dependency so that they can do work in our name. Uh, everyone has to be self-sustainable. Uh, we do help with projects and a little bit of support for a few of our leaders who are overseeing large regions. But overall, we believe that the national leaders need to uh, walk into their calling, walk into their role and lead their nations into a love and transformational relationship with Jesus. And so I think that can be done by living somewhere else, being based somewhere else, but the attitude and posture has to be one to serve, to equip. And for us at Joshua Nations, we understand that we are always the junior partner. And I don't come and open up my toolbox and say, Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to transform your nation. Uh, many times I will start a relationship with a scouting trip, uh, and that will be going with really no agenda. I might preach in some churches. Maybe we do an evangelistic event of sorts, but there's no real agenda. There's no program. Uh, we may not launch any kind of school or do anything like that, but it's really to hear the heart of the leaders and uh, through hearing their heart, we can determine how best we might be able to come along and serve them so that they can assume the role and the call that God has placed on their lives. That is awesome. One thing that I love about what you're saying is that it's a little, it might be a little bit different for some people, depending on what their view of missions is. And uh, one thing that I've noticed is it seems like uh, the the missions spectrum is quite diverse. And as long as you're doing what God's calling you to do, it's probably a good thing for you. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. And it's, it seems kind of foolish in my eyes for us as missionaries, because I've heard story after story of, of, of long-term missionaries throwing stones at, at short-term missionaries and saying, you're doing it wrong. And, and short-term missionaries throwing stones at long-term missionaries saying, you're doing it wrong. It's like, Hey, like, Maybe God is more than just one method. Maybe he uh, is a, a diverse God and he has a way bigger picture than our super limited view. And uh, so it's awesome to, to hear about how God is using Joshua nations in that itinerant role, raising up nationals to, uh, to really have a serious, significant impact. People who had never heard of Jesus are coming to know Jesus and you live I, I, wherever you live, you know, like you live uh, not in that nation. So it's just, it, I mean, praise the Lord that he's diverse and that there's a lot of different ways to do missions. 
Yeah, there's definitely so many different ways. And the key, like you said, is obedience. Just do what God has asked you to do. Don't do anything more and don't do anything less. There's there's one thing that uh, drives me crazy is when I hear people, like you said, throwing stones at others. Um, in Ephesians 4, it makes it very clear that the body is diverse mm -hmm. and we are gifted in different ways. Uh, before we can see Jesus return, not only do we see every people group reach with the gospel, it also says uh, unity in the body. And so when we see unity in the body, wow, uh, how much more powerful and effective can we be? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's such a unique time right now. And I, I see the body is becoming more unified than ever before. Uh, and I'm grateful for that. I also see the advance of the gospel moving faster than mm -hmm. ever before. And today, as the world is kind of... And still, in some ways, uh, I believe there's a preparation for an incredible harvest that's about to happen as soon as we're released again and uh, able to really go after it. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited for that. And I know a lot of people in this season are spending a lot of time in prayer and in the word. And even from some of the testimony you've shared so far on this episode, uh, you've talked about different times in prayer with the Lord. Uh, I know that you're a man of prayer and it's really important in your life and ministry. Um, why don't you tell us about that? Like what, how do you pray for your ministry and how do you see the role of prayer in your ministry specifically? Yeah, we are, as a ministry, we're, we're trying to rally a campaign. I'm calling it a movement, even though we're not there yet, but I would love to see a thousand people mm. praying for the completion of the great commission. Mm. And uh, so we've been championing this call to prayer over the last couple of months and not knowing really what was going to be happening in the world. Uh, this is a wonderful time to press into prayer if you've never done that before. A prayer looks like a different, again, it's very diverse. It looks different for everybody. Um, in the mornings, I like to read the word and pray. I also like to pray while I'm out walking or running or, or by myself. Um, if I'm in my car or alone, um, I like to pray as well. Uh, there's, And for me personally, I think there's kind of different styles of prayer that happen throughout the day. Uh, most importantly, it's about having a communing relationship with the Lord, knowing that uh, the Holy Spirit is there with you all the time. And so uh, without all of the I guess religious motions are going through a program. Uh, you can talk with God right where you are. You don't have to begin with formalities. The scripture is clear about ways to pray as far as being thankful, praising him, uh, being respectful and honorable. But I think so many times we kind of get caught in the trap that we have a list, mm. like almost like a, the honey do list. And, Really, can you imagine being on the other end of receiving that from, you know, millions and millions of people every day coming to God with their honey-do list, their chore list? I need this. I need that. I want this. Please do this. Why haven't you done that? I'm angry at you because of this. I'm so grateful that God is big enough to handle uh, our uh, silliness or nonsense at times. Uh, he's big enough for our questions. Uh, he's big enough when we get frustrated or even angry. And he, uh, he bears with us through that. But I think about the Lord right here with us right now, even as we're talking. And we could just begin to thank him for what he's doing and praise him for who he is. And then ask him to move in us that we would be obedient and receptive to do whatever he wants us to do. And if that's talking to our neighbor, if that's uh, speaking to someone that we haven't talked to in a long time, making a phone call, initiating a conversation through text, uh, whatever it is, uh, as we listen to God, uh, then he can move in us and through us. And personally, I found that the more I keep my mouth shut, the more powerful my prayer times are. 
Mm-hmm. I think we like to fill the silence with words. Mm-hmm. But if we're always running our mouths, how can we listen? And so my challenge to you, as you are listening to this, you obviously probably, uh, I don't know what your situation is, you're probably not talking as you're listening. <laughs> I think about that in the context of prayer. Uh, say what you want to say. Uh, be grateful. Connect with God. Pour out your heart. But take time to listen because uh, he wants to speak to us. He wants to share his heart with us. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. I, I think that's so applicable, just making prayer conversation. Uh, not a formality, but an a everyday, normal language, normal kind of conversation, but with the living God. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how does that look for you in the context of an unreached people group or an unengaged people group where there's spiritual darkness? These people have been bound in captivity by Satan for generation after generation. Don't, do not have the light and glory of the gospel yet. Their eyes are blinded. Um, how do you see prayer working in that context? Is it important to pray before just diving into that? Uh, <laughs> what, what's the power of prayer when you walk into a situation or a region like that? Uh, I know that Nathan and I have also stepped into those regions uh, quite often. And uh, sometimes there's like this, this, it's almost hard to describe, but like you walked into a demonic jello, you could say. Uh, spiritual darkness in the air almost. Just, just like this force of darkness opposing the kingdom of light. And so how do you see the power of prayer and the, the role of prayer in that kind of scenario? Well, I think prayer uh, is paramount there. You can't, it's of the absolute utmost importance. And, and I too have experienced that many, many times, both internationally and here in the U S where you walk into a situation and, and I love that analogy. Like you walked into a demonic jello, uh, you can feel it, physically yeah. feel it. Mm-hmm. And um, honestly, as you spend more time with the Lord, he will tune your ears and your senses. And often you'll get to a place where you can feel it if you don't feel it physically. Uh, yeah. There's been times where I was traveling throughout uh, India, Pakistan, and, and we'd be driving. And it was like, it's like we drove into that jello. We drove into that fog. And I I reached over to my friend and I said, wow, what's going on here? There's an oppression that's here like I haven't felt in a long time. And we began to talk about uh, the whole region and what's going on. So prayer is so important because in in scripture we see that uh, we're battling in the spirit realm. We're not battling flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers, uh, spiritual darkness. And, and as you read that passage, you see that there is a hierarchy, there's levels. Yeah. And so I believe that when we enter places that have not had the gospel, that there are spiritual strongholds. They have been under a cloud of demonic power. They've been under a cloud of influence that does not honor Jesus. And because of that, their eyes are blinded and they do not see truth. It's one of the reasons why I'm uh, trying to rally a thousand people to pray with us and not only just for the harvest, but I'm giving them specific directives as we're going into nations. And we've seen as there have been uh, large groups of people raised up to pray specifically for the nation of Niger, we're seeing breakthrough. And uh, I believe it's because of the prayer that we're seeing breakthrough now that hasn't been seen over the last 2000 years. And so we say we're praying against that spirit of Islam. We're praying against that spirit of animism. We're praying against those uh, spirits that cause domestic abuse and violence and whatever the different things are that those people have been dealing with. Then we uh, direct prayer towards and against that and that God would turn their hearts towards the truth. And uh, so just looking at, uh, spiritual warfare, if I can use those words, uh, that that is just as, but actually way more strategic than putting together a plan of action for training and discipleship. Because as we pray against those things, and we pray for God's revelation and truth to happen in those different areas amongst specific people at a specific time, 
And then we take the good news, we take the training, we take discipleship to them. We see breakthrough uh, both in salvation. We've also seen tremendous uh, moves of God where people get healed. Uh, they see physical healings happen right before their eyes. And I know that happens because of prayer. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. I, I love what you shared and how you shared it. Um, and what Nathan had said earlier about the book of Acts, it's like, we're still in your stories, these book of Acts type things still happening. And I think this pattern we see of those early believers is prayer. Like they often met together and prayed, uh, the power of the spirit acts one, eight to be witnesses and then action, obedient action. So if you mix prayer, the power of the spirit and obedient action, man, you got some wild movement ahead. (laughs) Right. And the cool thing about that is it's not super depend like god is the active figure in all of that he uses us and we get to be a part of it but like god is the one who's unlocking the nation of niger for in- instance uh, i i've been feeling something really similarly about our work among the hadza um this year my like my jaw was on the ground and my eyes were opened uh to like just a a a, a it felt almost exponential and i'm like I'm so convinced it's because we've been intentionally praying throughout the year that the Lord will be working, mm-hmm. continuing and continuing and continuing. And uh, it just seems like prayer is that, 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 that key. Um, the Lord moving is that key <laughs> uh, to unlocking the nations. Yeah, absolutely. And I would encourage every person who's listening, if you don't have a people group to pray for, yeah. There's wonderful information you can get online. Um, we don't uh, we don't have to feed you that information, but you can find that, and and God will burden your heart. Now, if you're looking for specific information, sure, reach out to uh, to uh, Charlie or or Nathan, or or you could reach out to Joshua Nations if you wanted, and we could definitely connect you with some things to pray for. But I remember uh, before I was really focused and hard after the uh, the finishing of the Great Commission by reaching unreached people, I remember God called me one afternoon to start praying for uh, a particular people group and region within the nation of India. And it began uh, about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, and it happened every day for like four days. And I'd end up uh, praying and just praying and actually weeping over this particular region and people group for, I think it was an hour, two hours at a time. And uh, if I remember right, I think it was four days. And um, and then about a week later, after that was done, it was like that burden lifted. A friend of mine in India said, hey, Jason, I want you to look at this. And he shot me a video. And there was intense, violent, horrible yeah. persecution that was happening in this region. And uh, I said, what is this? Where is this going on? And they told me. And, um, and I said, oh, my gosh. And I was like, when was this happening? And he gave me the timeline. And it was almost to the minute of when God had burdened me to pray. Mm. And uh, I don't know what God did, but I do know that he burdened me to pray for those people. And I, and I did that. And what God did in that region later on, which was really incredible. I was able to go there. Uh, It was in the state of Orissa, India, which um, if if you've studied any kind of missions, you'll know that over the last 10, 15 years, uh, they have suffered some of the worst persecution in the world. But there was a a great reprieve that happened a couple years ago. And I was able to go in and uh, share the testimony with them. And pray with them. And we started some schools and I encouraged them. I was like, Hey, this is, this is an acts two opportunity. Don't let persecution come in without you doing what God wants to do through you during this time. Cause otherwise you're going to end up in acts eight again, where persecution comes and scatters you again. So take hold of this opportunity. And it was really a powerful time. So uh, all that to say, when God burdens you to pray for a specific people group, I'll do it because you don't know what may be happening at that very moment. Mm. Uh, if that's in the middle of the night, uh, the Lord woke me up the other night uh, about 3.30, 3.40 in the morning. 
And it was actually for a, a person here in the U S mm. and I couldn't shake it. And, um, it was kind of odd. I woke up with this almost like a migraine headache and I never get headaches. And it was so intense. I'm praying. I was like, God, take this headache away. I want to go back to sleep. And he's like, Hey, have you asked me if I, if I want you to pray for something? I said, Oh, well, what do you want me to pray for? And the name of this person came to my mind that I hadn't thought of in a long time. Began praying for them. And, uh, sure. wasn't too long after that. I was, fast asleep, woke up perfectly fine, no headache. But uh, I remember praying for that person that next morning. And I really felt like God said, I asked you to pray for them. And I had to wake you up with a headache to get your attention. I said, okay, thank you, Lord. <laughs> That's a good story. Super That's good. cool when God does stuff like that. If, if you're listening and you're saying, hey, where can I get general information about people groups around the world? There's two really good websites. Uh, peoplegroups.org and joshuaproject.net. Uh, they're just general ministry websites that post people groups and statistics, uh, places where you can check them out and pray. Um, yeah, Jason, if, if people are saying, man, I'd really love to be in contact with you or Joshua Nations, what's the best way they can reach out? You can go to our website, joshuanations.org. We are not the same as Joshua Project, though we love them and their base is just down the road from us, uh, but uh, joshuanations.org. You can connect with our prayer movement on there. You can send us an email uh, from there. Uh, we're a small team, so if you send something, I guarantee that I will see it. I will read it and respond. Uh, but we would love to uh, serve you however possible. But no matter what, I would just say be obedient to whatever God is telling you to do when it comes to missions, whether that's going, sending, mm. praying, or getting involved, uh, serving locally, no matter what, just be obedient to whatever God is telling you to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. And uh, thank you to all of you who are listening. Um, that is all that we have for this week's episode of Fuel for the Harvest. And uh, just remember, uh, the Lord is alive and active. Uh, the book of Acts is still uh, happening today. We hope you have a great rest of your day. God bless.